Well, there was a couple, Jim and Debbie, who were living in Chicago. And during one of those brutal Chicago winters, when it was just really, really cold, they decided that they wanted to get out of town for a couple of days to get some sunshine. And they were snowbirds, so they had a place down in Florida. But Debbie had to work an extra day, and so Jim was going to go down a day before her and kind of get things ready. So he took a flight to Florida, and upon arriving, he went to email his wife to let her know that he, you know, made it there okay. And, but in his email that he was writing, when he was typing in her name, he got one letter wrong, and his email ended up being sent to a lovely old lady in Nebraska, And this lady was a pastor's wife, and she had just lost her husband about a week before Um, he had died, and 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 um, so he Jim was writing this letter, and she was quite surprised, this old pastor's wife, to receive a letter, an email that she thought was from her husband, and she was even more surprised by what it said, especially because, like I said, he had died a, a week before. And so the message went, my darling wife, I just wanted you to know that I arrived safely here, and I'm looking forward to you joining me here tomorrow. (laughs) Signed your beloved husband, and then he gave this P.S. P.S., it's hot down here. Well, in Revelation chapters 15 and 16, we come to the final series of God's judgments, the seven bold judgments, where God is continuing to pour out his wrath on a world that has rejected him and rejected his son. We're going to look at these two chapters in their entirety this Wednesday night as we continue our through the Bible study in uh, the book of Revelation. And we're, we're going to see that after centuries of waiting for men to repent and centuries of putting up with, with the arrogance and the rebellion and the hatred and the greed and all the bloodshed that has come you know, upon mankind from mankind all of these years, that God will finally say, enough is enough. It's time and it's over. And we're going to see how that plays out on Wednesday night. But today, I want us to focus in on the end of that that part of the the story here in chapter uh, 16, where we see the battle of Armageddon. And there are two great battles that are going to happen, the Bible tells us, in the last days, and both involve the nation of Israel. And we are potentially seeing the stage being set for one of those battles in the news today. If you've been paying attention to the news, you know that Iran has been making threats in these last couple of weeks to attack Israel. And if you are a student of Bible prophecy, you know that Anytime you, you read of Israel and Iran being in um, you know, some type of battle or threats being made in that direction, you know that that is significant because in Ezekiel chapter 38, the prophet Ezekiel prophesied that Persia, which is modern day Iran, would come against Israel in battle in the last days. And that when they came, would come against uh, Israel, that there would be a coalition of nations that would join them. And he tells us which nations those will be. He tells us that, that it will involve Magog, which is Russia, Meshach, Tubal, and Gomer, which are all parts of modern-day Turkey, Ethiopia, which is modern-day Sudan, and then Egypt and Libya. Libya. That all of these nations in the last days will come together and join forces to come against Israel. 
Now, for years, Iran has been making threats against Israel. Back in 2000, their current supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, stated that this cancerous tumor called Israel must be uprooted from the region. And then in 2005, their president, Ahmadinejad, he he said that Israel needs to be wiped off the face of the map. And then two weeks ago, Khamenei once again commanded the Iranian forces to launch a direct attack against Israel in retaliation for one of the Hamas leaders being assassinated there in Tehran. But what's interesting is up until recently, Iran's efforts against Israel have all been what we might call indirect attacks as they have been employing terrorist groups, Hezbollah and Hamas, to do their dirty work. And it has been well documented that Iran has been supplying Hamas and Hezbollah with weapons and training for years. And we know that Iran was very much connected to the October 7th attacks on Israel. And we also know that Russia has been supplying Iran with military training and technology and weapons for a long, long time. You could say that Iran and Russia have been joined at the hip. And the latest reports tell us that that Russia has as many as six warships ships in the Mediterranean Gulf, and two attack submarines. And then we actually saw Iran do a direct attack against Israel back in April. If you recall, those 300 or so missiles that they sent uh, toward Israel. And so as we hear all this and we see all this going on, the question that comes to our mind is, is are, are, what we're watching, is this moving in the direction of what Ezekiel the prophet said would take place, this battle in Ezekiel chapter 38? And the answer to that question is maybe. We'll just have to watch and see. But what's interesting to me about the battle of Ezekiel chapter 38, in light of our study in the book of Revelation, is that we saw this past week in our study in Revelation 13 and 14, we'll see it again in chapters 17 and 18, that in the last days, during the tribulation time, when the Antichrist comes into power, that he is going to set up a one-world economic system as well as a one-world religious system. And when I look at the landscape of religion today in the world, there are two main religious groups that I believe would resist a one world religion. And the interesting thing about all of these nations that would be joining Iran in that battle laid out in Ezekiel chapter 38, all of the nations except for Russia are nations that are Muslim nations that are following Islam. And Christianity and Islam are probably the two biggest faith groups in the world today. So it would seem logical for for the Antichrist to come on the scene and set up a one world religious system that something has to happen to these two religious groups, Islam and Christianity. Well, I think Islam, or excuse me, Christianity, what what takes them out of play in resisting the Antichrist coming on the scene and setting up this one world religion is the rapture. The Lord takes us out of here. The Lord takes us into heaven. And so we're not here on planet earth to resist him. But what about Islam? Well, I think the battle that takes place here in Ezekiel chapter 38, when God is going to intervene on behalf of Israel and wipe out this coalition of nations involving Iran and Russia and these other nations, and it will be clearly a divine intervention I believe that when Iran and these other Muslim nations are destroyed, that it is going to render a death blow to Islam. It will rock the faith of the Muslim world. 
And I think that this battle, Ezekiel chapter 38, could actually happen before the rapture of the church. And if not, it will happen shortly after the rapture of the church. So we, we are watching these events take place in the Middle East. As we're watching this, pay attention to Russia. Pay attention to these other nations. Now, as a church, we stand with Israel. And when I say that we stand with Israel, I want to be clear, that does not mean that we agree with everything that Israel does, as if Israel could do no wrong. In fact, by and large, Israel is a country that does not follow God. Even though there is you know, an orthodox segment of the people of Israel, it is in the minority, and even those who are orthodox do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. But most of the Jewish people, though familiar with their Jewish heritage and their religion, are extremely secular, and the people of Israel are a self-reliant people. So you might ask, why then do we as a church stand with Israel? And the answer to that question is, is because God does. Because God stands with the nation of Israel. In fact, let me give you a little quiz. I'm going to make seven statements, and I'm going to just think about who am I referring to. Here's statement number one. Without a biological miracle in the womb of his mother, his birth would have been impossible. Statement number two, he was declared to be the son of God. Statement number three, he was taken to Egypt to preserve his life. Statement number four, when he returned to his land Israel, he was despised and hated. Statement number five, he was bloodied and beaten and put to death by the Romans. Statement number six, but he came back to life again. And statement number seven, and he will ever live and die no more. Whom am I speaking of? Now, most of you would think you're obviously speaking of Jesus, and all seven of those statements are true of Jesus Christ, but you know what? They're also true of Israel. Let me give you some examples. Consider statement number one. Without a biological miracle in the womb of his mother, his birth would have been impossible. Well, we know that Abraham's wife, Sarah, was barren. Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation. Sarah was barren, and it was through a miracle of God that she was able to give birth, even in her old age, at 75 years of age. And she gave birth to a son that they named Isaac. Isaac, his wife also being barren, would have a miracle birth, and she would give birth to two boys, one named Esau, the other named Jacob. Jacob would have 12 sons, and Jacob's name would be changed to Israel, and he would be, um, his sons would be the 12 tribes of Israel. So we see, statement number one fits for Israel. What about number two? He was declared to be the son of God. Did you know that the Bible refers to Israel as God's son in Exodus 4, verse 22, as well as in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1? Statement number three, he was taken to Egypt to preserve his life. When Jacob, who was renamed Israel, was facing uh, famine, and really extinction through this famine, he sent his sons, 10 of them, to Egypt because there was grain in Egypt. And when his sons come to Egypt, they discover that their long lost brother, Joseph, whom they had sold into slavery, was now the second to the right hand man. He was second in command in all of Egypt. And Joseph, recognizing his brothers, doesn't take vengeance on them, but shows grace to them. And he calls for the whole family to come to Egypt and live and be rescued from the famine. And so Jacob and, and his sons and all of their families journey to Egypt, 120 in all, and they, they would stay, the people of Israel would stay in Egypt for 400 years. They would grow from 120 to 
over two million people until Moses led them out of the land or out of Egypt and into the land of promise, which brings us to statement number four. When he returned to his land, Israel, he was despised and hated. And we know The Bible tells us that when Israel came into the land of Canaan, that they were hated by the Canaanites there, even though it was the land that God had promised to them through Abraham. And that brings us to statement number five. He was bloodied and beaten and put to death by the Romans. Well, that would happen in AD 70 when the Romans came and attacked the nation of Israel, beaten them, bloodied them, tore down their temple, and from that point on, the nation of Israel would cease to exist. They they would be dead. In fact, in 135 AD, the Romans renamed Israel to Palestine. But then we see statement number six, but then he came back to life again. And for 2,000 years, Israel ceased to be a nation. But Ezekiel, the prophet, also prophesied in in Ezekiel chapter 37 about these dry bones coming back to life, and we saw that happen. 2,000 years later, on May 14th, 1948, the nation of Israel was reborn. Isaiah the prophet had asked the question, can a nation be born in a day? And the answer was yes, because it happened to the nation of Israel. This nation that had never, that had not existed, had been in a sense wiped off the map for 2,000 years, suddenly comes back to life again. That has never happened before or since. And that leads us to statement number seven, and he will ever live and die no more. And that statement is also true because God has a grand plan for that land. And it's made very clear to us in the text that we're looking at today at the end of Revelation chapter 16. And what we see before us in this passage today is another great battle, a world war that will take place when the Antichrist and his forces from around the world are gathered together against the people of God in the valley of Megiddo there in Israel. But Jesus is going to come with the host of heaven and he is going to intervene on Israel's behalf. Let's see how this plays out. We see the setup for the battle in verse 12. It says, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and the water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. It's interesting that the great river Euphrates is said here that it is going to dry up. The river Euphrates has been one of the most important rivers throughout human history. Along with the Tigris River, it makes up the cradle of civilization. It's known as the Fertile Crescent. At its height, the great river Euphrates was 1,300 miles long, 30 feet deep in some places, and 300 feet wide in many places. The river has been a vital source of fresh water to a very arid region of the world serving upwards of 23 million people. And when people would read this passage and they'd see this massive river and they'd see that that Revelation said it would dry up, they'd say there's no way that that could ever happen, but it's actually happening today. Check out this picture We see that the the river Euphrates, that much of where they're standing and off into that green part, all of that was at one point in time filled with water. But it has been drying up and the levels are getting dangerously low and there's a concern that the entire river might dry up by the year 2040. Our text tells us that an angel is going to speed up that process. That as he pours out his bowl during the tribulation time, the the river Euphrates is completely going to dry up. And the dried up river creates this unique pathway for the kings of the east to travel into the valley of Megiddo there in Israel. Now the question is, who are the kings of the east? 
And a survey of a hundred commentaries on the book of Revelation yields 50 different opinions as to who the kings of the east are. So who are they? Well, they are. Here it is. You ready? They are the kings of the east. Um, <laughs> Now, I will say most Bible commentators and, and of those 50 do give, you know, their opinion that it could be referring to because it, it actually reads in other places, in other translations, the kings of the rising sun. And so it could be a reference to a coalition of forces from Japan and China. And then the question would be, why on earth would Japan and China want to be a part of this battle? I think the next verses give us the answer to that question. Look at verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. And out of the mouth of the beast, who's the beast? The Antichrist. And out of the mouth of the false prophet, that's the Antichrist religious leader who's pointing the world and to the Antichrist and building him up with these, you know, miracles and these different things that he's going to be be doing. This is what we looked at, we talked about on Wednesday night as this unholy trinity. Verse 14 says, For they, this is the frogs, are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. What a bizarre vision that John has here. A dragon and two beasts, these frogs that are really demons coming out of their mouth. It's like a bad pizza nightmare that he's having here, right? I mean, this is crazy. But the passage indicates that the Antichrist and the false prophets being influenced by all this demonic activity coming directly from Satan are going to influence the leaders of the world with their mouth, with their signs and their wonders to go to Megiddo and attack Israel. This will be demonic influence on high. Verse 16 indicates or identifies the place where this battle will take place. It says, and they gather them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Armageddon is from two Hebrew words, Har, meaning the hill country, and Megiddo, which is a massive valley in the nation of Israel. We actually have a picture of this valley. This valley is humongous, 185 square miles and it's Har Megiddo from which we get the word Armageddon. And this valley of Megiddo, also known as the Jezreel Valley, extends from the Mediterranean Sea, from the city of Haifa, along the Carmel Mountain Range, and into the Jordan River Valley. It's massive. It's a battle where many, uh, it's a valley where many battles have already taken place. In Judges chapters four and five, this is where Deborah and Barak led the, the forces of Israel into battle. This is Judges chapter seven, this is the valley where Gideon had his victory over the Midianites. It was in this valley that Josiah was killed by the Egyptians in 2 Kings chapter 23. The Assyrians marched through this valley on their way to conquer Israel. The Babylonians also went through this valley on their way to conquer Judah. Many of the crusade battles happened in this valley, and Napoleon Bonaparte marched through this valley on his way from Egypt to Syria, and as he was marching through this valley, he made this statement, if ever there was a place where the final war of mankind should be fought, it should be fought in this valley. He had no idea that he was being prophetic. So when this sixth bowl is poured out, Satan and the Antichrist is going to gather the nations of the world into this valley for this final battle. 
And these forces are going to be coming against Israel, but in reality, they're actually coming against God. In fact, notice in chapter 17, verse 13, it kind of gives us a little more insight on this. It says, and they are, speaking of the nations of the world, of one mind. And they will give their power and authority to the beast. And these will make war with the lamb, and the lamb will overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. That's us. That's the church. This is at the second coming of Christ, and we will be with him. And Satan, knowing that the second coming of Jesus is close at hand, he he knows that the end is near. He comes with one last-ditch effort. And through this deception of this demonic deception and the words of the Antichrist and the false prophet, he brings the military might of the world together into this battle to fight against God. Psalm 2 anticipates this as the psalmist prophesied. He wrote this. It says, And the kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers, to take counsel together against the Lord and against his Christ. And they say, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Here's the nations of the world. We're, we're going to fight against God. He, he thinks he's so big. Wait, wait until he sees us. And Psalm 2 says, this is how heaven responds. And he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. (laughs) It's like God looks down at them and look look at all these foolish people. Oh, they think they're so great. They think that they're going to defeat me. Oh, no, what am I going to do? Well, Revelation chapter 19 tells us exactly what God is going to do. Turn over there, if you would. We'll get to this in uh, a few weeks. Look at verse 11. We have another picture of this battle that's going to take place. A little more detail. It says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is speaking of Jesus. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And his name is called, and just in case there's there's any confusion, it makes it very clear, his name is called the Word of God. And we remember in John chapter 1, John wrote, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 he said, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He's talking there of Jesus, and here he's called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. I hope you like to horseback ride. Um, I can't do that anymore because of my hip uh, replacement, so I can't wait to be able to ride a horse again, man. This is going to be awesome. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron, and he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to the, all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. It's feasting time, in other words. It's dinner time, he says to the birds, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And then the beast was captured with him, the false prophet, who worked the signs in his presence, and by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image." 
And these two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. So here is what we learn from Revelation chapter 19, that this isn't going to be much of a battle at all. That Jesus appears on the scene and he is going to slaughter these armies swiftly and completely. We learned in our study in chapter 14 on Wednesday night, another picture of this battle, that the blood is actually going to flow like a river, up to the horse's bridle for 180 miles. And like I said, the, the, that valley of Megiddo is 185 square miles. Guys, this is going to be a bloodbath like the world has never seen before. Gruesome, ugly. The vultures, the birds are going to feast on dead bodies for a long, long time. Now turn back to chapter 16. There's a couple other things I want to point out here before we go today. I want you to notice there in verse 15 again, I purposely skipped over this verse, that in the middle of the narrative leading up to this final battle, between the sixth and seventh bowl being poured out, there is a pause in the narrative as Jesus speaks. But I want you to notice that his words are not for the people who will be on the earth at this time when it happens. No, this interruption in the narrative is for us, the readers. It's a reminder to us that Jesus says, behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. Jesus cries out, behold, he stops, he has John stop, and he wants all of us to hear, all of us to be reminded, behold, I'm coming as a thief. And the coming of Jesus is often compared to a thief in scripture. Why a thief? Because it speaks of a suddenness, of an unpreparedness. You know, thieves don't call ahead of time. They don't call and say, hey, I just wanted you to know I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna be in your neighborhood on Friday. <laughs> Please leave your doors unlocked. No, they, they come when you're unprepared. They come in a time that you don't expect it. And Jesus said, that's what my coming is going to be like. And you might be thinking, you know, that doesn't feel very comforting, Pastor Rob. But the point is this. He doesn't come as a thief for believers. He comes as a thief to unbelievers. He never comes as a thief for believers. He comes to us as our bridegroom. In fact, listen to what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, you yourselves, speaking to the church, you yourselves know perfectly well that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night, but you, brethren, are not in darkness that this day should overtake you as a thief. Now, first of all, notice that phrase, the day of the Lord. When you read of the phrase, the day of the Lord, understand that it is not ever talking about a single day. It's talking about a time frame. And it's a time frame that starts with the rapture of the church, takes us all the way through the second or the, the tribulation time and up to the second coming of Christ. All of that time frame is known as the day of the Lord. And, and Paul says that day when the Lord comes shouldn't overtake us as a thief because he comes to us as a bridegroom in the rapture, to take us to heaven. And we're to be waiting and watching for him, but it is going to take the earth, the people of this world, completely off guard. It's gonna be sudden, but not us. No, we're, we're, we're to be aware of the signs. We're watching, we're waiting, we're paying attention to 
the signs that are taking place. We know that we are living in the last days. We know that there is nothing else prophetically that needs to happen before Jesus can come for his church. Notice in verse 16, or verse 15 of, of chapter 16, Jesus says, blessed is he who watches and keeps his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. He's saying, no, you guys watch. You guys be on guard. He's, he's using soldier language here. You see, in ancient times, soldiers slept with their clothes on. They didn't go to bed and put on their PJs. Because if they were attacked in the middle of the night, they'd look really goofy and they'd probably get killed, you know. No, they, they slept in their, their clothes. They, they slept with their sword by their side and their helmet nearby so that they could get up and fight. The Apostle John wrote these words to his church when he said in, in chapter two, verse 28, now little children abide in him that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So how do you get to a place of confidence and not be ashamed? Well, here's the question. Are you living for him? Are you watching for him? You know, I think every Christian is waiting for Jesus to return but are we all watching for him to return? And you ask, is there a difference? And yes, there is. In fact, it reminded me of a story of a couple of friends that went out on a little sailing expedition, a little fishing expedition. They went out on a fishing boat for several days. And as they were coming back after going out fishing for several days, they're coming you know, in toward the port and the skipper of the boat takes out his binoculars and he's looking there at the dock and he says, hey, I see Bill's wife and I see Joe's wife and I see Frank's wife and I see George's wife, but there was one guy on the boat that he didn't see his wife. And when they came to the shore, all these men, you know, were embraced by their, their wives and their families and welcoming home, except for this one guy. And he was kind of concerned, like, why, why is my, my family's not here? So he rushed home, he came in the door, and his wife saw him and said, oh, honey, so glad to see you. I've been waiting for you to get home. And he said, you've been waiting for me, but all the other guys, their wives and family, they were watching for them. They were down on the dock watching for them. Many are waiting for Jesus, but are they watching for him? Are you watching in anticipation like a bride would be waiting and watching for her bridegroom? Jesus says, behold, I'm coming. And Jesus is gonna come one day. And I believe it could be very, very soon that he's coming are you waiting and watching? That's the question. Now, one more thing I want us to, to note before we go. We're going to look at the seventh bowl being poured out in, in detail on Wednesday night. But, and we'll see in this final judgment that the earth is almost completely destroyed. But, but I want to just read a couple of verses before we go today. Notice verse 17 of chapter 16. It says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. Other translations put it, It is finished. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Notice that. There's a phrase there in verse 17 that is familiar. Did you catch it? It is done, or it is finished. Does that ring a bell in your mind? Does that ring a bell in your heart? Who also uttered those words? That, that was what Jesus said when he was hanging on the cross. After those six hours as he was hanging there and he was paying the price for our sins that he cries out, it is finished. And I believe that phrase is really the key to the Armageddon story. You see, every person has a choice 
as to whether they are going to be part of the great battle, the bloodbath that will take place at Megiddo, or are they going to be covered by the blood of Jesus at Calvary? And there's a great comparison, I think, that we can make between Mount Megiddo and Mount Calvary. In both, we see people coming against God. At Megiddo, we see the armies of the world coming together, joining the Antichrist, and coming against God, and coming against Jesus to do battle with him. And we could look at that and think, you know, how could that be? How could, how could the nations of the world be that debased? Well, we saw the same thing happen at Calvary, didn't we? That those at the cross yelled concerning Jesus, we will not have this man rule over us, crucify him. And they turned on Jesus, the Son of God, and crucified him. Both Mount Megiddo and Mount Calvary deal with the wrath of God. At Megiddo, God's wrath is being poured out on a world that has turned against him. And at Calvary, God's wrath was poured out not on a world that had rejected him, but it was poured out on his son who was on that cross taking our place, who was dying in our place, who was taking the punishment that we deserve. Both were bloodbaths. At Armageddon, the, the blood from those slaughtered will flow 180 miles. At Mount Calvary, we see a blood-stained cross. We see a Savior that Isaiah tells us was so disfigured because of his beatings, you couldn't even tell he was a man hanging there. His blood staining that cross. But we're told there in Isaiah chapter 53 that it's by his blood that we are saved. That it's by his stripes that we are healed. We sing, what can wash away our sins? Nothing, nothing but the blood of Jesus. We see that in both, there's an earthquake. At Megiddo, it's the final blow of God upon mankind. At Calvary, there's an earthquake. When Jesus cries, it is finished, and he gives up his spirit, the earth quakes, and the Bible tells us that the veil that was in the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, the holy of holies is that place where, where the Shekinah glory of God dwelt, and the high priest could only, and he was the only one who could go into to that holy of holies only one day out of the whole year but that veil that separated that was like a wall between those two rooms was torn in two the bible says from top to bottom as if god reached down out of heaven and pulled that open and what he was saying to us was it's open house Anyone who, who comes to me and wants to come to me can come to me through the blood of my son Jesus shed there on the cross. So we have a choice today. Are we going to stand on our own? Say, I don't need God. I don't need Jesus. I'll be good enough. I'll make it. We can stand on our own and be a part of the bloodbath of Armageddon or we can stand with Jesus and be covered and cleansed by his blood. The choice is up to you. The choice is up to every single person. You see, you can't be neutral when it comes to Jesus. Jesus said you're either for me or you're against me. Those are the only two choices. So the choice is up to you. Will, you. will you be a part of the bloodbath of Armageddon or will you stand with Jesus and be covered by his blood?